Well, um, little did anybody know that I was going to, the topic I was going to talk about today to focus us in on uh, the local church and Jesus and being passionate about Jesus. Um, and I won't let the cat out of the bag too early, but you're going to connect, see how the dots are connected this morning and what God's already done. So I just want to add to the prayers already prayed. And uh, we don't have much time together, but I'm just praying that God would move fast. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We're so great. You're so gracious to us. You are great and you're good at the same time. And your Holy Spirit's the same around the world. You are not compartmentalized, Lord, but you're moving around the world as much as you're moving right here in this chapel. And so please, God, continue to move in our hearts. Help us not to blow past these moments where you're present in a unique way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I got to get straight to the point, so here we go. I think we can become too familiar with God. I think we can get so familiar with God, and especially at a college, a Bible college, and a seminary where you're dissecting Greek errors, passive tense of, of words and things, and you're trying to figure things out. You get so steeped in the academics of it that you miss God. And you can, you can begin to get to hear about God and, and, and study God and, and dissect words and phrases and Bible verses and figure out how that applies to all different kinds of careers that you're going to head into. But we can get so close and to that whole thing that we miss God in it, um, the ex academic exercise rather than the off-filled experience. I'll never forget having a professor when I was here say, you man, sometimes being in the center of the will of God is taking the best notes you can in class. And I had to stop and like contemplate that for a week because <laughs> that, that seems like on the surface, but no, 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 that's deeper, that's deeper. And so I, I just think sometimes we can, perhaps the Bible is, is no longer living and active, but it's dull and dead for you. Perhaps that as you study these things, you, it no longer becomes shiny and brilliant, but it actually, it becomes dull for you, like, like, like you go into the motions, like you're checking it off your list, like you've got to get a grade for that, you've got to turn that in. And, and it's all this academic stuff up here, which is super important, don't get me wrong, I've gone on to school for a long time. But if you miss God in the midst of all that, I mean, the irony is, is that sometimes familiarity with the things of God can cause you to lose your awe of God. You get so into the details of junk, whether you're here in administrative, whether you're on a faculty member, whether you're a student, you can get so close to it that it becomes so familiar that you, you miss it. And how much more is that true in the local church? Where we, we don't take a moment to go, whoa, the Holy Spirit's here. Look what just happened in worship. Let's pause for a second. Let's keep that going for a little while. Let's continue this thing into the rest of my day. We, we don't do that. We, we just go, well, check it off your list. Got to do announcements today in chapel? Check. Got to do some worship music? Check. Got some speaker, dude? Check. On the rest of my day. Rather than pausing and going, man, it's not about showy styles or personal preferences or opinions or evaluations or cute band members or styles of music, or skinny jeans, or smoke machines, or light shows. It's not about that, friends. It's about glorifying God. Can I get an amen somewhere? Amen. I mean, that's, that's what it's about. But man, we can lose that, can't we? Me too. I mean, we, we're so tempted to be distracted with ADD when it comes to worshiping God. We, get, we see other things out there, and we miss it. We, we, we compare all the time. We, we, we evaluate all the time. And, and there's nobody that evaluates more than me as a lead pastor. Every single Sunday. There are some Sundays, well, and it's becoming more and more frequent as I think about this, where I have to walk in and go, God, help me not to evaluate today. Help me just to be in your presence today. Help me not to worry about whether those announcements came off right or that screen was right or we misspelled that word on the screen or whatever else. Help us just to get in your presence and do, just, just do business with you. And then I think about heaven, and that's what brings me, it calibrates me, it brings me back to some things like, like every ethnic group across the planet is going to be present around the throne, millions and millions and millions of people worshiping the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And we're, we're, there is not going to be a Chris Tomlin section or a Lincoln Brewster section or a Hillsong section or an Oregon section, there, there's not going to be any of that. It's just going to be some lively, awesome worship around that. 
And, and thank goodness sin is going to be gone and everything, all that. So all the distractions and all our selfishness is going to be gone. So we're not going to worry about any of that stuff anymore. We're just going to focus in on who Jesus is and what he did for us. That's why I love, love Psalm 145. Psalm 145. I'm going to give you a homework assignment because we don't have enough time to go through the whole thing. But go read 145, Psalm 145, over and over and over again. Ask yourself, Lord, how do you want me to respond to this? Let me just get into it a little, a little ways. Just a little ways. Here's what King David said. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. I hope that's happening and I know it is at Columbia International University. One generation is commending your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. Story after story after story of God's faithfulness. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyful, so, joyfully sing of your righteousness. You know what the solution is to being passionate about the local church? Getting your awe of God back. You get your awe of God back, then that's going to capture you, and then you're going to want to be with the people of God and worship and learn and grow and disciple and serve and care for and fellowship with, and that's all going to happen as a result of your awe of God coming back or being stoked. Throw some wood on that, that fire to stoke those flames. I mean, Psalm 145, the overriding worldview of this psalm is daily awe of God. Is daily awe of God. David got it. Man, after God's own heart, he wasn't a perfect guy. You know the story. But, but he, man, he, he loved God. He, he wanted to worship God. He, he had a harp to lead worship. He, he, wanted to, he wanted to be all about. And it wasn't about music. It was about his life. And so the, in this psalm, we just get this picture, this beautiful picture of a life designed to worship God. I mean, my thoughts are impacted by my awe of God. My desires are driven by my awe of God. The reason I treat my wife and my kids the way I do is because of my awe of God. When I look at Lori and Lillian and Levi and Lara, I am in awe of God. I function the way I do in my job because of my awe of God. Are you catching on yet? The way I handle my finances should be because of my awe of God. The way I think about physical possessions, personal position, power is led by the awe of God. Are you tracking with me? I mean, my, my relationship with my extended family and neighbors should be directed by what? Oh, of God. Yeah, you're getting it. The way I live, my, my, my wider community should be driven by the awe of God. The way I think about myself and others is because of the awe of God. Some of you need to hear that. Like the way you think about yourself, you look in the mirror in the morning, should be driven by your awe of God. Are you catching that? I mean, the, when you're discouraged, what lifts you up? The awe of God. When you're, when you're celebrating, you want to dance like this worship thing here. I mean, it's the awe of God that's going to do that. The awesomeness in, 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 in coming close to God. It should be driven by the awe of God. When somebody sins and falls short and it gets in your face, what should bring it back? The awe of God. That, that's where the grace is going to come from. When I experience the sin in other people's lives, it's going to be the awe of God. When, I, when I'm courageous or when I need strength or wisdom or my identity, it's going to be the awe of God that brings it back every single time. Listen, if the, if the local church is going to be on fire, it's going to be because that church gets the awe of God. They get it. They just get it. It's, it's the presence of God. Listen, materialism is not first a money problem. Materialism is an awe problem. If, I am, if I'm not in awe of God, it's very, very tempting, impossible for me to put my attention on physical things rather than God. Disobedience is not first a law problem. It's an awe problem. Just read the Ten Commandments. The first few of the Ten Commandments, which I believe are in order, have to do with putting your awe on God. Don't put God first. Don't have idol worship. I mean, get that right, and the rest will just follow. If the, it'll follow. The, the awe of God has to be there first. You know that definitions of words change over time? 
it drives me crazy. I can't keep up. I can't keep up with my kids. I mean, I get, they make up stuff. I mean, I don't, but, but it's like, wait a minute, that, that word changed definitions. Let me, let me give you an example. Like, like the word awful used to be full of awe. So now when you say something is awful, you say it's bad. Or we say that's awesome. Well, does that make any sense? It's like some awe. I want to bring back that God is awful. <laughs> Don't you? It's like we get confused. Like, like, no, he's not some awe. It's that awesome. It's awful. <laughs> Are you confused yet? I mean, I am, and I'm saying it. I mean, it's like, no, because you're going to accuse everybody if you do that. But we, words change over, over time, and things get softened, and other words come to the It's like, wait a minute, that's a, that's a bad word, actually, and I'm saying it all the time. What, what? That's not good enough. That word's not great enough. That doesn't describe it good enough. So, you know, we, we, it's crazy. Let me just tell you a little bit more, because it's kind of fun, about Psalm 145. It's an acrostic psalm. All the Hebrew letters start that, when you look at the Hebrew of it, except it misses one letter, noon. It's the 14th letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and, and it skips that one, and, and I won't go into all the details, and Dr. Byer or somebody else can explain it all to you, but that, the numbers matter with the Greek alphabet, or I'm sorry, the Hebrew alphabet. When you get to the 14th one, noon, I mean, that, that, that it's, it's the original DVD, because the, the vowels are dropped in a DVD, and, and, and it, you know, that looks like an awful lot like the word David. And it just, it just, it's amazing when you add up those, those numbers, it gets the DVD, and, and it, I, David wrote the psalm, and it's interesting that he dropped that Hebrew letter out of the alphabet of the acrostic of the psalm, and, and I just think he's pointing to a greater king. Now, maybe I'm stretching it too far, but I just think he's pointing to a greater king, which is the theme of the whole psalm anyway. So he's just pointing to, man, we need to have this awe of God, and it seesaws back and forth, this psalm. It seesaws back and forth, and where it started, it ends. And it goes back and forth to how great God is, how good God is, how great God is, how good God is, over and over. That's why I'm giving you a homework assignment. You need to read the whole thing and check this out. Because your awe of God will drive your personal life, your ministry, in the local church, where you're headed, whether you're heading in the business field, wherever you're heading, it's your awe of God that's going to drive it. And sometimes you need to grab onto God and hold on for dear life. Because it's like a 747 taking off. And you're like, oh my goodness, God, I don't know where we're going now, but I want to be in awe of you and just watch you work, see what you're doing, how you're going to work in my life and in my family's life, and how you're going to blow our expectations away through this. Just look at verses 1 and 2. Paul, uh, I'm sorry, David makes a declaration. He says, yes, I will exalt you, my Lord. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. So there's question number one. Are you going to make a decision with your will to say the same thing that David said? I will exalt you, my God, the King. It doesn't matter what I feel like right now. It doesn't matter what circumstances I'm going through right now. It doesn't matter how, how, if everything's not lining up quite the way you thought it was going to, wherever your stresses are, wherever your fears are. I'm going to make a decision anyway to engage my will and my emotions will catch up. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. David did it. Listen, reflection exists for affection. Reflection, when you study the Word of God, it ought to exist to get your affections lined up with God. So you don't just study out of duty to check it off your list. You study the Word of God so that your affections, your emotions line up with that. So you make a decision, I'm going to study, I will exalt you, my God the King, I will praise your name forever and ever, and now, Lord, engage my heart, because I really want that to be true in my life, in every single nook and cranny. I want that to be true. Another way to say it is theology is for doxology. Theology, studying God, is for you to worship and dance for God. It, that's why it exists, that's why you study. Now, some of you, can I just drill down and go to your hearts? Because this is our last morning together. Some of you are considering these things. You're here at Columbia Bible College, Columbia Biblical Seminary, CIU, and you're considering some things. 
I'm not naive. Some of you, because I had friends when I was here who were in the same category, I'm quite certain through the last 20 years, it's been true every single year, there are some students who are considering these things, but they're not submitting to them. They're considering, it's like you consider the Word of God, but you don't submit to the Word of God. You consider these things. I'm going to consider. I'll pray about it, Jeff. I'll talk to others about it. I'll study it longer. I'll, I'll figure out whether I, I want to exalt my God the King and make that declaration of my heart. I will consider it. But I'm not going to submit to it and come underneath of it. Because that would mean he actually is the King of my life in every area. And he has permission to speak into every area of my life. Are you tracking with me? See, every single one of us are tempted to, we fight that all the time. There's a huge difference between this and this. We fight it all the time. Oh, I don't want to do that. You know, and, and so you need to, listen, you need, in, in a generation that's coming that's driven by emotions and feelings, you need to sometimes engage your will and say, I am going to exalt my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever and ever and ever from now until all of eternity. I'm going to do that no matter what the circumstances that come my way. Are you with me? And so stop considering everybody and start submitting. Stop considering whether you're going to do that or say, I'll pray about that. or whatever. Some things I tell people in my church all the time when I ask them to do some things that just make sense and they're gifted for it and, and they can rearrange some time and whatever else. I say, some things you don't have to pray about. Seriously. Some things are just like, should you make disciples? You don't need to pray about that. Should you tell people about Jesus? You don't need to pray about that. Should you go across the street and tell your neighbor about Jesus? You don't need to pray about that. You just need to, okay, now God, got to line it up because I'm going. I'm going. Some of you guys, it's because of you lost the awe of God that these things, now, now all of a sudden you, you're not in awe of God when you read the Bible, so you must be reading like second hesitations or first opinions. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not totally engaged. And so now you're, you're messing with it, considering rather than going, God, I know this is true, but I don't feel like it, so now you, you need to engage. Verse 3, great is the Lord and the most worthy of praise is greatness no one can fathom. Verse 5, wonderful works and awesome works and great deeds. Cry out declaring our great creator God. He's huge, glorious, boundless, unlimited. It's unbelievable. I just want to give you one crazy simple example that it's going to blow your mind when you think about it. And some of you guys know this stuff better than I do. But let's just talk about something that's very, very simple like water. Just water. Okay? Water is colorless, odorless, without taste. God, God could, could have given it flavor if he wanted to. It could have been like a little raspberry in there, a little, little mint, minty freshness, something, but he didn't. He, it's, just, it's just odorless. It, it's flavorless. It, 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 it's amazing, though, because, I mean, without it, you, nothing can exist on this planet without water. But, but God set it up so even before he split the waters at creation, he had to create water. He, H2O, he had, he had to create that. It, it has an unusually high boiling point and freezing point. Water allows us to live in an environment of fluctuating temperature changes while keeping our bodies at a steady 98.6 degrees. It's incredible. Water is a universal solvent. Property of water means that thousands of chemicals, minerals, nutrients can carry throughout our bodies and into the smallest blood vessels. Water is also chemically neutral. Without affecting the makeup of the substances we carry, water enables food, medicines, minerals to be absorbed and used in our bodies. Water has a unique surface tension. Water and plants can therefore flow upward against gravity, bringing life-giving water and nutrients to the tallest trees on the planet. Water freezes at the top, starts at the top and floats so fish can continue to survive underneath. 97% of the Earth's water is in oceans, but on, on Earth there, there's a system designed so that the salt's removed from the water and it recycles all the way around so that we'll survive. God came up with this, no big deal. No big deal at all, really. I mean, it's crazy. It's water, everybody. You're going to go get some at lunch. It's crazy. Why am I telling you that? Because, because all over the place is showing off the glory of God. All over the place. The, the, the breath you take, the water you drink, the, for you to be able to survive today. But we get so preoccupied with all these other things, don't we? And we lose our awe of God. Let me end with this, and I think C.S. Lewis does, does it well. In the line which in the wardrobe, 
C.S. Lewis writes, after Aslan, you know, the Jesus figure rises from the dead. Here's the picture of Aslan with the girls. Just I mean, even close your eyes and picture this, and, and picture you're in the story. He's the lion. Uh, Aslan leaped again. The mad chase began round and round the hilltop. He led them now hopelessly out of their reach, now letting them almost catch his tail, now diving between them, now tossing them in the air with a huge and beautifully velveted paws and catching them again. It was such a romp as no one has ever had except in Narnia. And whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or playing with a kitten, Lucy could never make up her mind. And the funny thing was that when all three finally lay together, panting in the sun, the girls no longer felt in the least bit tired or hungry or thirsty. Friends, you're going to have to balance between the greatness of God and the goodness of God. The greatness of God is like there's a little bit of fear around the lion. But the goodness of God is he's going, come give me a hug. A little bit of fear. He's giant. He's huge. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. But on the other hand, he's a lamb. And he's saying, just come, come hug me. I mean, he, he's that balance where we just can't comprehend. It's unbelievable. And it should cause you to just go, I'm just more in awe of you. And then you can declare like David said, I will exalt you, my God, the king. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. If you want your local churches to change, you need to change first with your view of God. Your awe of God. Get as close to him as you possibly can. And understanding how great he is and how good he is. And don't swing the pendulum too far either direction. Hold the tension right there. Man, he, he's a lion. I'm not sure if I should get close, but oh boy, I love having his paws around me. Let's pray together. Take a moment and just comprehend. Just let it sink in. Let Psalm 145 just... Just bathe you. Some of you, some of you need to carry this into your everyday lives. Some of you look forward to chapel and having something like this happen and have great worship, Holy Spirit led, and have the Word of God taught, but some of you have not figured out how to do this in your everyday life yet. So this is just compartmentalized. This isn't carried into every area of your life, whether you're on the soccer field or whether you're cooking meals last night or whether you're in class studying or whether you're in the library looking something up or whether you're with friends off campus. You haven't figured out how to be in awe of God in those places. So Lord, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit Help us to offer our bodies living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. This is our spiritual act of worship. Help take every single area of our lives that we're tempted to hang on to that part and give it to you because we're in awe of you, because we love you, because we want to pursue you, and we know you're pursuing us. And we know, Jesus, that you've risen from the grave, and we're about to celebrate that in just a little while, in a couple weeks. And all of heaven's going to be rejoicing too. We get to remember this act again. And then for all of eternity, we get to surround your throne. Surround the, the lion and the lamb at the same time. The greatness and the goodness of God all right there at the same time. It's going to be awesome. But bring heaven to earth today, Lord, for us. We love you. We're so grateful. And I pray for Columbia International University that you would help this school continue to be in awe of God continue to have wisdom to make the right decisions around every area because they're in awe of God. And they'd be launching out students worldwide who'd be making a huge impact that would just keep telling godly stories over and over and over again, and it would spread like wildfire across the globe. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.